King James Version is um, as close to the original text as anything else you're going to find. And then ESV is a really good mix between the two. And then the last one um, is um, the Amplified, A-M-P, actually C. All right, let's jump into it, okay? Today, I want to talk about how to understand the Bible, all right? Here's my goal. My goal is to give you three terms to properly interpret God's word, all right? First one, exegesis, exegesis, all right? If you got your, if you got your um, app open, they're right there, okay? I try to give you as much information as I had so you would, you'd, be, you'd be there, all right? Y'all got it? All right, I'm going to read it. Exegesis is an approach to reading the Bible that involves pulling information from what it says. In other words, exegesis is simply explaining or interpreting what the scripture is actually saying. Okay? It's you looking at the actual context for what it's saying and only what it's saying. Okay? Eisegesis is when we approach the Bible and insert our own idea of what it says. Believe it or not, 90% of Christians um, practice eisegesis and not exegesis. We got to change that. Tell somebody, say, we changing that, okay? Exegesis is, the, is where you want to go. You want to stay in reading the Bible, but receiving only what it is actually saying, okay? When we talk about exegesis, the Greek word uh, for exegesis simply means to explain or to narrate. I'm trying to give you just, just simple text right now before we really jump in, okay? If we look at the Greek root word of exegesis and eisegesis, you can just look at the first, the first three letters, okay? X simply means out of, okay? Ice simply means into, okay? That's the, that's the easiest way that you can remember, okay? X is out of, ice is into, okay? When I'm looking at the scriptures and I'm trying to see what is this scripture actually saying, I want to know only what is God wanting me to get out of it, not just what God want me to insert into it. The common mistake we often make reading the word of God is trying to find what we can get out of the, out of the context. The Bible is not designed for you to just view it selfishly and figure out what you can get out of it. If you, if you view every scripture that way, then you're going to look at it out of context because some scriptures are historical. And you're going to be looking at some scriptures and be like, I got to shave my hair because the Bible said the women can't have long hair. And then you're gonna be, I'm like, what you doing? You might, like, well, the Bible said to shave my hair. I'm like, well, you took it out of context. I'm preaching. All right, so when you read the scriptures, I'm not saying that there's not something for you, but we read the word to know him. Come on, somebody. We read the word to know God better, not to just get something out of the word. You will get something out of God every time you read the word because the word is life-giving. Amen? All right, let's keep going. Here's an example of horrible eisegesis. All right, go to Revelation chapter 8, verse 13. I want to help you, okay? In fact, somebody bring me a mic really quick. I, um, wait, who, who's a good reader on this front row? A good reader. Nobody on the front row want to read. <laughs> My goodness. You got me? All right, over here. Right there, right there. Anything? Yep. Just read Revelation 8, 13. As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in midair call out in a loud voice, woe, woe, woe in the inhabitations of the earth because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. Amen. You got that gentle voice. <laughs> All right. It says, as I watched, I heard an eagle. Eisegesis is this. Oh, I heard an eagle. Oh, the eagle must be Something about America, because America's national symbol is an eagle. <laughs> the scripture has to be talking about America. But the problem with that 
is if I look at the author, who was John, John was in the Midwest, and this was like 1,700 years before America was even a thing. So John wouldn't know nothing about America, right? Uh, that was like a, a, an over-the-top like, example of eisegesis, but it's so easy to look at words that remind us of something else and insert what we think it actually means, okay? Don't do that. I just gave you a really crazy example, but when you read the word of God, don't just look at words and be like, oh, that looks familiar, or that, that reminds me of something in culture. God's not trying to fit his word into culture. God's not trying to fit his word into something outside. God's word encompasses everything, okay? So when you read the word of God, look at the word for what it is actually communicating. I'm going to show you how we do that tonight, okay? Y'all with me? Okay. Here's another example. Don't shoot me for this. Tell your neighbor, don't shoot him. Okay. Uh, in the 1700s to like 1800s, the Bible was used really to justify um, slavery on like African Americans. This is like a really big era. Like, like during that time, like tons of pastors was like, yo, I can have slaves because the Bible said I can have slaves. But the reality is, is that slave drivers would misinterpret the scriptures on slavery to keep people into their own desires. Okay, this is how we pass on ignorant, uh, ignorant generational like patterns when we just continue to take something in the word and just say, this is what I think it means and then just keep passing it on, okay? Get the context of what it's actually saying so that you don't make mistakes that our forefathers have made and we're actually bringing and we're passing on blessings through proper knowledge and understanding of the scriptures, all right? Those are my two horrible examples of eisegesis. I'm going to leave it alone. Exegesis is what you want to do. Eisegesis is what you want to stay away from. Amen? Okay. Then we get to the third one, which is hermeneutics. If you were here last week, say, hey. Okay. Hermeneutics simply means to interpret. It's that simple. Okay. When I look at the word of God, I use hermeneutics to actually find out what the word was saying. Okay. Hermeneutics is not a biblical term. It's just a term that you can use, or it's just a resource that you use to find out what was the writer actually communicating, okay? If you're reading something that requires, um, how, should, how can I say it? An interpretation. In other words, it was wrote outside of your time, then you need hermeneutics, all right? Did anybody do like a Shakespeare's project back in school, okay? All three of you. If you, if you did a Shakespeare's projects, project, you probably went to the website and used something called Sparks Notes, okay? So all y'all cheated. That was hermeneutics. That was a hermeneutic, okay? It, it interpreted basically what Shakespeare was about. Okay, so when I say hermeneutics, it's you genuinely looking into resources to help you go back into proper context of what the scriptures was saying and only saying, okay? All right, so let's talk about how to actually interpret the word. I'm gonna give you three things, okay? They're, they're right in your, in your um, app and you can just write in your notes if you want to, okay? The first thing is this. You gotta look at the historical context, historical context context. Somebody say history. Okay. Since the Bible is a historical document before teaching, you need to understand the history of it. This is going to frustrate you. If you are new to God, the first thing you want to do is jump in and figure out how does this work? How does this life work? What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to live? What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to say? What am I not supposed to say? That ain't the joy of the Bible. The joy of the Bible is God. We read the word to learn more about God, which means you got to go back into the history of what the text was about to learn who God is and how God was. If you hate history, you're going to hate Bible. How many of y'all fail history in school? Y'all want to raise your hands? Okay. Uh, she said, I teach it. it it's Learn, learn to fall in love again with history class because the Bible is so full of history. It was written outside of our time, which means you got to go back and appreciate what was the context saying, okay? 
So your first one is historical context. That's number one. Always go back and find out what was the scripture actually saying? Who, who, who was it talking to? What was the history of it? What was happening during that time? Right? These are simple questions. I'm, I'm going to go in detail on this in just a little bit. Okay? But that first one is historical context, human, uh, uh, hermeneutics. Okay? Here's two questions you ask when you're looking for the historical facts or the historical meaning of what a scripture or a chapter was talking about. These two questions. Ready for them? Number one, what would this have meant to the author? What would this have meant to the author? Not to you, but to the author. Okay? Here's a second one. What would this have meant to the original reader if it was meant for me? And, and who was it meant for? Okay? Remember, some of the word is not supposed to hit you in your head. Some of it was written for people who were operating in things that they shouldn't have been operating in or areas God wanted people to move forward in. Okay? So when I read it in historical context, I'm genuinely learning to look at the word and say, okay, God, is this for me or is this just the history that you want me to learn about who you are? Okay? That's important. So that first one, the first question you need to ask is, what would this have meant to the author? Second one is, what would this have meant to the original reader it was meant for? Okay? These two questions help you stay away from eisegesis. See what I'm saying? Make sense? All right. All right. Here's your second one. Is literary context. Y'all didn't know you was back in college, did you? Literary context. Okay? All that simply means is what is the literal framework of this word? What, what, what is the framework of it? Here's, here's examples of the literal framework, the language. I told you last week that the Bible is made up, uh, written in three, in three different languages. Y'all remember what those languages are? Shout them out. Hebrew. Aramaic. That's right. And what else? Greek. Come on, somebody. Look at the scholars in the room. Awesome. All right. So an example of literary context is the languages. Okay. Um, this is super important because it's necessary to understand the scriptures by not just looking at the English interpretation, but go back on the languages. Okay. Hebrew. If you go look back at it in Hebrew, you will quickly realize you've been reading that thing. All, all wrong. Because some of, some of the understanding truly won't give you actual context until you look at a word in Hebrew. Okay? If a word stands out to you in the scripture, go back and look at the Hebrew interpretation or understanding of what it is. Go look at the Greek interpretation of what it actually is trying to say to you. And I promise you, you'll have more moments where you're like, ah, Okay, that makes sense. Okay? So that's one. All right? The other part of the context is the, uh, not, not just the history, but who, like, and where, geography. Where was, where was this taking place? What was this taking place? What was happening during that time? This helps you create a framework for the word that you're reading. All right? Let's keep going. Here's the third one. Faith context. This is so important. This probably should have been the number one. When I say faith context, I mean this. Everybody in this room will approach the Bible um, from a different experience in their life. Okay? For some of you, you picked up the Bible as a Baptist. For some of you, you picked up the Bible as a Pentecostal. For some of you, you picked up the Bible as a prostitute. For some of you, you picked up the Bible as a, you know what I'm saying? Everybody will pick up the word of God from a different place in their life and a different allegiance in your life. But the only way to truly interpret the scriptures is to enter the scriptures by faith. Come on, somebody. If you do not pick up the word and say, I'm going to understand this by faith, then you will read the scripture through your Baptist mindset. You will look at this scripture through your upbringing. You will look at these scriptures through uh, how somebody treated you. You have to look at these scriptures by faith. 
When I say by faith, I mean in the spirit. Amen? All right, so the first one, historical context. Number two, literary context. Number three, faith context. All right? We good? All right. On that faith context, let me just tell you, uh, one of the things that um, should be the same in everybody's life, I told you, is faith. Uh, one way we all are on the same page is by committing to those three eyes. What are the three eyes? Exactly. So that means all of us are now on the same page. We all believe that this Bible is without error. We all believe that this is this word was written by or through authors, authors, excuse me, um, used by God. That's how we all get on the same page. And then by faith in the spirit of God, we read these scriptures and we say, God, breathe on these scriptures so I can have an understanding of what you were trying to say. Amen. All right. Let's, let me jump to what I've been what I'm, I'm trying to get to. I try to recap a little bit for you. All right. Now I want to teach you five keys to understanding and applying God's word. Let's have some fun. Y'all get anything out of this? All right. Here's number one, revelation. Revelation. Okay. Holy Spirit is the one who authored these scriptures. Okay. The Holy Spirit is the one who authored the scriptures. Okay. God's word is God breathed. Somebody say God's word is God breathed. When I say breath, breathe, I mean breath, which means ruach, which means wind. Wind is the spirit of God. God's word is the wind of God. It's God in motion. I just did hermeneutics for you. See? That's why God's word never dies. The flowers fade. Oh, the, uh, the uh, flowers, what is it? The withers, uh, the flowers wither, the flowers fade, but the word of God shall what? Stand, remain for ever. Why? Because it was not made off of anything that is not eternal. It was made from the breath of God. <sighs> that's, 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 uh, so, so the word of God is like you breathing. You are being sustained by the Ruach, the wind of God. Then your, your flesh will go back into the dirt, but your life will still be sustained by the wind of God. Why? Because your life will start with breath in your lungs, but your life will end with breath in your soul. That is good. I got to keep going, though. All right. So revelation, okay? Holy Spirit is your guide. Say that. Holy Spirit is my guide. He's your God. He's your teacher. And he brings all understanding to your life. The word of God absent. Oh, you trying to understand the word of God absent of the Holy Spirit's help is no help. You will not understand it upon the Holy Spirit bringing you understanding. I want to help you. Okay, John 14, 16, 17, it says, and I will pray, I will pray that the Father and, and, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. Verse 17, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be what? In you, right? John 14, 26, jump down a few verses and it says, but the helper, who? The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will what? Teach you some things? No, some things. 25%. Then why don't you go to him for all things? I'm preaching. He said all things. All things means everything. Everything means everything. You ain't got to guess nothing. This is beautiful. Jesus' words. These are Jesus' words. He will come and he will guide. He will teach you all things, which means anything you don't know, you should go back to the author first. It's good. Teach you all things that I said to you. That goes back to the wind of God. 
God could say something 2,000 years ago and it still is speaking to you today because the wind and the breath of God never dies. If you don't invite the Holy Spirit to come in and teach you and give you wisdom, you will struggle understanding God's word. Here's why. Because the author is God, who is a spirit, not logic. Did you get it? The one who wrote it is a spirit. So the only way to interpret it is in the spirit. So th this can get you so far, but your spirit will bring you into revelation. All right, I got to keep going. Okay. You cannot understand spiritual truths without revelation from the Holy Spirit. All right. If I can pause right here and encourage you, if you do not wake up in the morning and say, good morning, Holy Spirit, start tomorrow. I genuinely mean that. Talk to him. He's your friend. He's not an it. Holy Spirit is not an it. Holy Spirit is a he. And he is your friend. He was sent as an advocate. That word advocate is helper. It is the equivalent of a wife. I'm not making that up. If you go look at the Hebrew word and Greek interpretation of the word helper, you'll see the, the exact same parallel as a wife. That's, Bible, that's why the Bible says, when a man finds a what? Definitely didn't say when a man finds a woman. When the man finds a wife, when the man finds a helper, right? Why? Because a wife is, marriage people, y'all getting some of the, the uh, stuff from the marriage uh, conference. A wife, a wife shows up fully equipped the same way the Holy Spirit has access to the mind of God. That's why you should never ignore your wife. Look, listen, ladies, next time I throw y'all bones like that, y'all better amen. <laughs> Fat, say it, Pastor. I ain't saying it again. You missed it. <laughs> okay. I cannot understand the spiritual things of God unless I depend on the spirit of God. Okay. If you try to open up this book, Charla, and, and try to learn it not by faith, you will never receive revelation. You are only receiving information. And you will come to the end of yourself and information, then you'll be frustrated. Anybody ever been there before? He's like, I just don't get it. You know why you're not getting it? It's because you're not allowing the spirit of God to bring you back understanding in all things. You don't listen. There are some things that you can read. You don't have to even go to a hermeneutics a resource. You can say, Holy Spirit, bring me the revelation right now from the mind of God. And the Holy Spirit will bring you a supernatural thought that comes from the mind of God. Who else knows the mind of God but the spirit of God, right? So the same spirit that knows the heart of a man is the same spirit that knows the mind of God. I do it all the time. Holy Spirit, go to the mind of God and bring back an idea. It happened before several weeks, uh, several years ago. Somebody asked me what deja vu was. I sat there literally in silence for five seconds. I said under my breath. Holy Spirit, go to the mind of God and tell me what this simply means. What is deja vu in this moment? He said to me these words. Deja vu is nothing more than your flesh catching up to where your spirit's already been. Now, I wish I could take credit for that thing. But, 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 but when I told this woman what I had never heard from, heard of, she gave her life to Jesus that night. She could not cross over the understanding of what deja vu was. So she came for that one reason. If this pastor can tell me what deja vu was, y'all, can you imagine if I would have, I'd have been like, uh. <laughs> but I, Holy Spirit's the cheat codes. We ain't got to figure out all things. We ain't got to figure out why. Because he comes to bring and teach us all things, which means he goes and bring things from the past and the present. You ain't got to worry about your future nor your past. All right. Second one. Okay, first one is revelations, right? A revelation. Second one is consistency. Consistent. Oh, my goodness. I got to go down this one. 
okay? Being dedicated to the word of God is a must, okay? I'm not talking about daily devotions. I ain't talking about, I'm gonna get in trouble. I'm not talking about the little one scriptures that come up on your phone so that you can read it and feel good about yourself for the rest of the day. That's called a devo. And the issue with devotions is devotions teach you how to be um, a, a believer who only visits the word of God. The, 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 the pros, let me, let me go back. The pros of this, though, is that you are, you are coming to the word of God. That's, that's perfect. But the word of God was not meant to be visited. The word of God was meant to be lived out. All right. Okay. Look at your friends. Say, be consistent. Okay. You got to read the Bible on a daily basis. I'll be honest. I've really struggled with the word of God um, for like years. I didn't get it. Didn't understand it. I was like, God, this is the most boring thing ever. And I heard him say back to me, I'm not boring. You are. <laughs> this word is not boring. There is more rated R stuff in this scripture. I mean, there is, I'm talking about, there's some stuff I'm like, God, I, I'm not really sure if I would have served you back then. What you mean you sent a lying spirit? Why you, what you mean? Like what's going on? See, we, we skip over them scriptures. I mean, you just let Abraham just take another slave woman, have a baby by, and then just like, and then she don't like him because she's talking about her other son. And then she's like, you got to dismiss him. And then you're going to look at Abraham and be like, you listen to Sarah, dismiss him. <laughs> what? <laughs> this is the Bible. I'm not making it up. You know, where you can get it up. <laughs> that baby got to, it's your baby. <laughs> you got to go. <laughs> she said you and your mama. Be consistent. Joshua, give me, let me give you some scriptures. This is I know I ain't reading from no refrigerator manual. Joshua 1, 8. It's right there. This book of the law shall not depart from my mouth. My goodness. But you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good what? Success, Matthew 4, 4. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by what? Bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He just lets you know that the written word is a word that came out of the mouth of God. This is why we look back at the three eyes and we, run, and we understand that even though man may have penned it, God spoke it. Amen. Okay, so Jesus compares, look at this scripture back at Matthew 4, 4, G Jesus 4, 4, Jesus compares the word to bread. Okay, I ain't talking about the bread that you and I eat. The bread that you and I eat, we got preserv preservatives in it. Okay, like real, real bread gets stale quick. God was saying, I need you to eat the word every day because if you eat the word and then skip and then go back to that same word, when you go back to it, it's going to be stale. God never becomes stale, but living by bread every single day is you showing up to the word in need of it every day. If you don't go to the word every day, then you start to live a stale life and live off of God last year and live off of encounters last week and live off encounters from five years ago. This is why we say stuff like, I'm just trying to get back to like when I was like on fire from God. I was on fire for him. I remember back in the day, that is the biggest lie. You, God's not trying to get you back to anything. Oh, I got to attack that for just a second. I, 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 I know, maybe, maybe you've lapsed, maybe you missed some time, some prayer. But listen, I never read one scripture. The only thing that God says do is go back to your first love, not to your first encounter. Right? So... Stop trying to get back to, just say, God, I'm going to live in your word every day. This is daily bread for me. Your word is daily bread. This is there's something fresh for me 
today. Amen? All right, let's keep going. The more you read it, the more familiar you will become with it. That's very important, okay? This is the only time I'm going to tell you to become so familiar with God. Become so familiar with the Word of God. When you read it, you'll start to understand. Uh, let, me, let me give you an example. Uh, like the Passover, okay? Probably the first time you read the Passover, you're like, this is really, 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 really weird, okay? They had the Passover feast, and they're celebrating. And like, what does this really mean? And then you go start to look at the, the part in Exodus where um, God told them to go in the house and then put the blood over the doorpost, and, and then and he passed over. You're like, oh. You'll start connecting dots. The more you read it to just learn about him, Every time you get in the word, you'll start connecting dots about what God was actually trying to say and what God was trying to um, communicate during that time and what God's trying to communicate to you now. Okay? Is that good? All right. Number three, observation and interpretation. So important. Observation and interpretation. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15 says, Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay? God gave you a mind for a reason. That's called intellect. Intellectual property of you is God's mind in your mind. Okay? God gave every single person a mind so that you could observe and interpret the scriptures, okay? God ain't trying to, he don't want you to just depend on whatever. He wants you to not only just depend on the spirit, he wants you to use your brain. This is for the super, super deep people, okay? The reason why your brain is so important because it'll help you not take scriptures out of context because we're trying to be so, so, so deep. Some things is not that deep. Some things is so deep, it's so simple. It's so simple, it's so deep. Like God's love, how deep, how wide. All right. Uh, I do feel the Holy Spirit tell, tell me, I'm going to stop there. I was just joking for just a minute, but, but here's the truth. Uh, reading the word of God outside the context of love um, is a really dangerous thing. Don't, don't look at these scriptures outside of the context of love. From Genesis to Revelation, you will see that God is so madly in love that he will do anything and everything he can to get people back to him. Even, even if he has to destroy them. Sweet. I know that's a hard, I know it's a hard thought. Okay. So just like uh, Genesis, for example, in the beginning, Adam and Eve, this is not my notes, but Adam and Eve, right. They, um, fell from grace. Right. And it, it can look like God was like genuinely upset. And so God was like, y'all got to go. I hate you. And, and he kicks them out. Right. But the context of this is, they were only kicked out because he didn't want them to stay in that state of sin forever. Why? Because they, which tree did they eat from? Sure, it's ice solid. Which tree did they, they eat from? Uh, the tree of what? The tr okay. So, they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which means what was sealed had been revealed, which means they became like God. There's no other way to say it. What he knew, they knew. What you don't know, you will know in heaven. They became fully, un they fully understood what, they just knew what they knew it. So to protect son and daughter, he decided before you now reach out and touch and eat from the tree of life, because if you eat from this tree, you will be eternal. 
before you reach out and eat this tree, let's do something about it. I love you so much that I'm going to kick you out so that you don't live in this state forever. That's love. That's not hate. It's just him saying, I'm going to do something about sin before you live in this state forever. That's love. Revelation. He comes back, people still here, and he's still giving people chances to bow. Why? Because he's a God of love. He's all about love. Amen? All right. I just want to say that. Like, don't, don't read this Bible outside of love. If you do, then you'll, 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 it'll be weird. All right. We talked about observation and interpretation. Here's what I'm saying. When you read the word of God, this is, this is, this is what I do. I look at the big picture, then the small picture, and I look at the big picture again. Okay? The big picture, when I look at a scripture, is what overall is this chapter talking about? What is it really saying overall? The general meaning of it. Then I start to look at some of the small details, which is where we start to look at like the Greek words, the Hebrew words. So this word stood out. Oh, it says breath, but when I go look at the Hebrew word, I see that means the ruach. Oh, and then I look at that word. If I translate that word back to English, it simply means wind, right? You start to dive in. That's you, that's you looking at the small things, okay? Uh, where, where were they? Then you go, after you look at the small things, you go back to the big picture. So big picture, small picture, back to the big picture. Do not try to enter the Bible looking at the small picture first. In other words, don't try to go in looking for revelation. Go in to look at the context, what he was actually saying. If you do that, if you do it backwards and you try to go for the like revelation, the deep things first, then you'll never, you'll take it out of context because you'll make it about what you discovered, not what it was saying. God wants to evolve in his word, but he doesn't want you to write something new to his word. Am I helping you? So uh, macro, micro, macro, however you want to say it. I, I say big picture, small picture, big picture. So look at, look at what it's saying. Look at the small things, the details of it. For all the deep people in the, in the room, like, oh, Jordan River. Okay, let me look at this and look at that. How many I'd like to do that? How many I'd like to look at the scripture and be like, I oh, you're digging it. Get all the good stuff. I do it all the time. Okay? But I don't start there. I just don't start there. When you start there, you'll take it all out of context, okay? All right, observation and interpretation. First off, when we look at, when we talk about observation and interpretation, the first thing I would tell you to do is do this. Identify the book. Which book am I reading? Remember that graph I showed you guys? Charlie, can you throw up the, do um, you still have that chart by chance? No, it's okay. Do y'all, y'all still have the chart from last week that I gave you? Okay. Um, remember, uh, like the, first, the first five books is basically the law, right? And then it goes to historical books and then poetry and wisdom um, and poets. Then it goes into the prophets. And then the prophets are broke down into my, uh, major and then minor prophets, right? And then you go into the New Testament historical books and then you go into epistles. Now, um, and then you go into Revelation I, I typically leave Re- Revelation book by itself just because it's simply just revealing Jesus. Uh, but when you read a scripture, it's important that you look at the breakdown of what this book is actually saying. Is this about the laws? Is this wisdom? Is this history? Right? Or is this uh, an epistle? Whatever it is, it's a letter. The reason why I say do that because how you look at the book is how you interpret the book. If you look at the book as a law, but it was a letter from Paul, then you will make Paul's words doctrine. That should have never been doctrine. This is a really big mistake people make all the time. Yeah, but the Bible says. Yeah, but it's not under laws. It was a letter and it was a letter to a specific group or a letter to a specific people. See what I'm saying? So when you do it, identify the book 
that you're actually reading, okay? The book that you read should have an impact on how you interpret that book. If I'm reading a book that is under the category of the law, then it will have an impact on my life concerning laws, okay? A doctrine, how God wants me to actually live, okay? I see some of y'all fanning. I'm so sorry, y'all. It is hot in here. Some days it's like super cold. Some days it's like super hot. We can't find a happy medium. Okay, she said we just super hot. All right, can we keep going? All right, so let me just, I'll give you two, two things uh, that I typically look at. Epistles, okay, is an area that I would encourage you look for teaching that applies to you. That's a good area. How does this apply to me? Okay, you have epistles that was written to like the overall and then you have Paul's epistles uh, that was written specifically from like from him. Okay, uh, historical books that deal with the history of God. You are looking at how God interacted with people and you're seeing his nature in it. Okay, I'm looking at God, how God interacted, and I'm, I'm out of looking at how God interacted with people, I'm seeing the nature of God. The reason why I can tell you that this whole book is about love is because I look at the history, I look at the laws, I look at the forgiveness, I look at Jesus all the way through it, and I realize by the time I get to Revelation, it was all about love. It was all about getting you back to Eden. It makes sense? Okay, so, so all of it was really about bringing everyone back to, but how, if I don't have the categories in my head, what this, bu this book is actually trying to communicate, then I'll take it out of context, okay? So, Epistles, that's a really good area, a, little, a really good area for you to actually look at. This is, I'm going to apply um, something in this scripture to my life. Okay, history, I'm looking for the nature of God. I'm looking at how God interacted with people. All right, after you've identified the book that you're reading, the second thing I would encourage you to do is ask who, what, when, where, and why. Okay. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this stuff because if you don't read the word slow, then you'll miss the word, okay? Ask who, what, when, where, why. Here's a few things I would encourage you to ask. Who's the author? Who wrote this? Is it Matthew? If it's Matthew, Matthew wanted you to know one thing. Jesus is king. Is it Mark? Mark wanted you to know one thing. He's the son of man. Is it Luke? Luke wanted you to know one thing. He's the son of God. Right? So you look at the authors to see overall what, were they, what was their overall goal in communicating their perspective and the interpretation of the scriptures. Okay? Second one is look at the purpose. Why was this written? Why was this written? Most books, you can find the purpose in the context of the book at the beginning of the chapter. If you don't have a book that gives you the like general purpose of why, find a Bible that has the general overview of these chapters, okay? And stay away from the NIV. Third one is what's the overall theme? What is the general theme of this entire chapter? Okay, fourth one, uh, some pastors don't do this, I do this. What's the overall tone? What's the overall tone? Looking at the entire chapter to look at what God was actually saying, what he was trying to communicate and how he was saying it. Some things God said sounds mean, but he wasn't trying to be mean. All right. What number am I on? One, two, three, four. Tone. Okay, here's number five. What's the historical and cultural backdrops? In other words, what are things? I'll give you an example. Um, somebody shout lukewarm. Okay, lukewarm, I was telling Sarah this, I think when she was preaching a few weeks ago, lukewarm uh, is not really about whether you're living for God or like not living for God. It's, Jesus was pointing to three specific towns, three specific group, three specific areas. One, one area was on a, on a hill, one area was at the end of, uh, of, of, I mean, on the mountain, the other area was at the bottom of the mountain and another area was like over here east um and all three 
were using the river of the mountain. And the flow of that river and the water was creating the water supply for these three areas. Well, the one in the middle, by the time, well, let me start with it. The one on the mountain, they would always get the water from the valley because it was the coolest. So it was very refreshing, okay? The one on the far east, by the time the water got to them, it was super warm. So they would use the water for bathing. But the one in the middle, by the time they got the water, there were so many things in that water um, that was not healthy for them, it would literally make them vomit. So they would have to clean the water first. So when he says, I would rather you be hot or cold, he was saying, I would rather you be like a refreshing mountain or like a sauna, like a bath, a hot, a hot bath, hot shower, but you're not. You're this type of water with so much in it that it literally makes me vomit. So God was talking to the church saying, I wish you would be like a refreshing drink of water to somebody or be like a hot shower to somebody, but you're neither. You're no good. Context. But I, like, I never would have like learned that unless I went to like the historical context to look at the geography of the story. What was he talking about? Where were these things? Look, when the Bible tells you where stuff is and, and names of people, don't just look over it. Don't just say, I can't even say that word. Figure out how to say it. And then, and then Google like where that is in Israel. Go look at where that is because it'll give you actual context. Many of the things that Jesus said, he was pointing to. Okay, all right. Historical and cultural backdrops, okay? Last one is recipients. Who was this intended for? What was the intended audience? Okay, who was God trying to talk to or who were the apostles or the disciples trying to? To communicate to, all right? Um, when I talk about who is this for, one thing I would encourage you to do is just break down a chapter and break down a verse, okay? Commas and periods and semicolons, all those things are in the Bible to break up thoughts. Most of what you read is one big thought, so the Bible breaks them down by putting punctuations in it so that you understand it better. But sometimes a punctuation can make you cut off a point that should have kept going so that you can get the full understanding of it. Okay, so sometimes when you read the scriptures, say, Holy Spirit, what, was this one big thought that you were trying to communicate? Like, what is it? All right, so sometimes break the chapters, break the verses down. What's the idea behind this chapter or verse? Okay. Um, when I talk about the, um, when I talk about breaking it down, one thing I encourage you to do is always go back to the original languages, go back to Hebrew, go back to Aramaic and go back to Greek. You will not fully understand the word of God. Can I just say this? Everybody go invest in this, go get a Jewish study Bible. I spent a lot of money on it. Like if you ask like, if, like for your birthday this year, tell somebody I want a Jewish study Bible. I want like the, I want the nice one with like the hardback books, the hardback covers, okay? Don't ask to go get your nails done. Go get a Jewish study Bible. I'm telling you, it'll change your life. It'll change your life. All right, let's keep going. Last one, or almost last one, meditation. Psalms 1 verse 3, I mean Psalms 1 verse 1 through 3, I'll read it really quick. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law, he meditates when? Day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in its season. That word season, uh, I don't have time to go through it. That word season is not um, uh, winter, spring, summer, fall. That word season um, is a Hebrew word that means appointed, uh, appointed meeting. It means when God's ready. It means when God stands in front of it, he wants to eat from it. It's why 
when he looked, when it's why he was in front of the fig tree and the fig tree didn't offer him anything to eat, he cursed it because it was its season to feed the king and didn't have anything to offer it. Seasons in the Bible is not um, winter, summer, spring, fall. Seasons is an appointment with God. All right. Whose leaves also shall not wither and whatever it shall prosper. Okay, meditation is keeping the word in your mind. Meditation is keeping God's word in your mind. In other words, repetition in thought. Keeping God's word on repeat. I thought we could meditate, Pastor Chris. There's worldly meditation and then there's godly meditation. Okay, God's level of meditation is looking at his word and then repeating his word in your head over and over and over and over again. The world says, empty yourself, empty yourself, empty yourself. God says, feel yourself, feel yourself, feel yourself. Okay, that's the difference. Meditation in the world is empty yourself. Meditation in the word, word is feel yourself. Okay, but you've got to meditate on an object. The object is the truth of God's word. If you don't give your mind something to meditate on, which is the truth of God's word, then you will go back to meditating how the world meditates. All right. Does that happen to anybody? Okay. All right. Last one. Application. So much about application. Matthew 13, 12, it says, For whosoever hath, uh, whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall it be taken away even what he has. Application is where you experience the word. I hate to tell you this. If you read the word and you get an understanding of that word, but you do not apply that word, you will not be in the kingdom. This scripture is specifically saying a person who knows the word, but does not apply the word he will take the word from you and you will not inherit the kingdom. Because this word was designed to be lived out. It's no good to, to have drinking water and you never drink the water. Okay? So God's saying, don't have life available to you. Know of it, have information about it, but never have revelation in it. Live out the actual word of God. I know that was, that was probably a deep, ending, but I hope that helps you to know why, why you dive every day into the word of God. Okay. Next week, what I want to do is actually take my computer and I'm going to show you how I literally like proper hermeneutics. I'm going to teach you based on like my study time, how I go from this, this, this word and then software that I use through Logos Bible to actually find scriptures and bring it all together. To, to teach you what I, what I teach you on Sundays, okay? All right, uh, next week I would really show up because it'll be the easiest way for you to go back into your own, own space and say, all right, this is how I can, I can apply it for myself. I know me teaching it like this, sometimes you're like, well, like how do I find this? What resources should I use? So next week I'm gonna give you all the resources that I use and then I'm gonna actually show you how to go to the Word, how to go to the software, until um, I actually find like what this actually means, okay?